do that this time also. This lecture doesn't take that long. Okay, cool. So we're here to talk about opening proposition, which to many people is the most frightening position and everyone freaks out. We're going to lose, etc. Um, so I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to talk about opening proposition generally very quickly, why I think it's really valuable, kind of how I think you should think about being the opening government. That's going to take two seconds. Then I'm going to go through the two major types of debates and talk about what I think the components of a good first prop case in both types of debates are. Uh, and then that will be the lecture. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Then we'll do some practice, I guess. Uh, so, first proposition is unique because I believe it is the only position in the debate where you can lose every argument you make and win the debate. <laughs> now, what, what do I mean by that? Um, because I think it's possible that although ultimately all the arguments you make are defeated by the end of the closing opposition, your level of contribution to the debate exceeds that of any other team in the round. And that happens fairly frequently. That, that opening government will make three or four really big, straightforward, awesome arguments, and then nobody will be able to respond to those arguments. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, no, no team will make the same substantive level of arguments as the opening proposition team. And so I kind of think that's how you have to think about the position. The goal, and too many people try to set up an opening prop case by thinking, what arguments can I make that nobody can respond to? And that's the worst way of thinking about opening prop. A much better way of thinking about it is, what are the major proposition arguments in the debate, and how can I make them best? The goal is not to make your arguments impervious to responses. It's to set up the strongest proposition case for your position as you can, despite the fact that you can predict responses to some of those arguments. Now, you may wish to make those arguments in such a way that those responses are preempted to some degree. But too many times I see people in first prop saying, well, we can't say that because there's going to be uh, this response. We can't say that because they're going to say this. That is not how this um, type of debate should be approached. So I think just when you're thinking about first prop, the goal is to set up the best debate you can by putting forward the most proposition ground you can, not necessarily to try to win the debate, uh, to, try to try to make arguments that are not uh, able to respond to. Cool. So let's talk about first prop. Uh, in general, there are two types of debates. This is a very broad strokes, but there are two types of debates. There are policy debates, and there are what we call analysis or value debates. And I've summarized them here. Policy debates ask if some actor should do something. Often, that is a government. So often, it's like, this house would abolish uh, you know, the death penalty, right? And that's a government doing something. But it doesn't have to be a government. It could be this house believes that doctors should refuse to treat patients who uh, are not vaccinated, right? That, that would be a person doing a thing. Or this house believes that parents should uh, install spyware on their children's computers, right? That was a motion I saw. So that's a person, a group doing a thing. Um, doesn't have to be a government, often is a government. So that's one type of debate. It's called a policy debate. Uh, should we do X? Another type of debate is called an analysis debate or a value debate. And that asks, rather than should we do X, it asks, is the following statement true or false? So for instance, this house regrets the Arab Spring. There's no advocacy in that debate. No one's saying anyone should do anything. I mean, it might follow from your regretting the Arab Spring that something should happen, but that's not the subject of the debate. The subject of the debate is, do we regret the Arab Spring? Is that statement true or false? Or uh, this house you know, um, believes that whatever. Uh, Smartphones have done, that was the motion um, at World Schools, I think, that smartphones have done more harm than good for interpersonal communication. We're not talking about banning smartphones in this debate or making any laws about smartphones or even anyone changing their behavior with respect to smartphones. It's just a statement, uh, just a question whether that statement, that more harm than good is true or false. Does, everyone's clear on the distinction between these two types of debates. And, 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 and those are the types of debates that exist in, in this format. I mean, obviously these are very broad uh, groups, but, but it's helpful to think about this because I think there are uh, two different approaches to first proposition depending on what type of debate you're in, whether it's a policy debate or a, um, excuse me, an analysis debate or a value debate. Cool. 
So let's talk about how to make a first prop speech in uh, a policy debate. Okay? So there are three steps, I think, to every first prop speech. Now, I'd like to be clear. You know, I'm going to give you what I think is an outline that's been effective for me in making prime minister and deputy prime minister speeches. For both types. For both types. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and that's kind of next. But I want to be clear that, like, you know, you have to think. Right? One of the, most, the funniest things about teaching debate uh, is that people are always like, well, what is the strategy? And I can give you some ideas as a strategy that have worked, but, but you have to be willing to adapt uh, to circumstances. Make it about looking for some type of magic uh, solution. So I'm going to give you an outline. I'm going to say this is what I think typically makes a really good first prop speech. But there could be instances in which parts of it don't need to be used, etc., and you need to make those value judgments on your own. Makes sense? But, but this applies in a lot of cases. So you're the prime minister in a policy debate. There's the first thing that I recommend you do is make, and you've probably heard some of this maybe in different words. Make the status quo intolerable. Sometimes it will say describe the problem. I think that's insufficient. I think you need to describe the scenario at the moment in such a way such that someone who heard your description will believe that something needed to be done, right? Because otherwise, why do we do it on proposition? And when we're saying someone should do something, well, if the situation right now is not such that someone needs to do something, then why, it, it, it makes sense, why are we advocating this? So I think you need to introduce a scenario that should be the first portion of your prime minister speech. Why is it that the way things are now is not tolerable? We cannot, so, you know, if it's legalize all drugs, we can talk about there's rampant overdoses, there's mass incarceration, there's uh, drug wars taking place both in the United States and uh, in other countries, in Mexico and, and, and Colombia and El Salvador, whatever, right? <laughs> Describe the scenario such that no one who listened to you, no reasonable person who listened to you, could be satisfied that the status quo is acceptable. Right? I think that's, that's the first thing they have to do. Now, it doesn't mean you face gloom and doom scenarios. Sometimes you just think, like, look, things could be better. Right? So you just explain the situation as it is. Make sense? Cool. That's the first step. First prop speech. Second step. Introduce your solution. Some people call this a model. I really hate jargon. Uh, and I think it's really unhelpful. So I try to make these things a little bit more plain language, but that's a model, right? You're going to make the model. So you've described a problem. The status quo uh, is intolerable. You know, we have a rampant overdoses, drug war, whatever. What is your solution going to be? Well, it's whatever the motion asks you to. It could be we're going to legalize drugs. Let's say we we're, we're talking about. Um, no, we need to invade uh, Syria, let's say. You know, you describe the status quo. It's a disaster, blah, 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 all these things. It's a genocide. And then you say, okay, what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to describe to you our solution, right? That's the next element. So often, people describe the status quo, and then they go into making arguments and never articulate clearly what their solution to this problem is going to be. Wrapped up in this is, like, trying to think about whether your solution attempts to solve the whole problem or only part of the problem, right? That's often a big issue that happens in debate and makes debaters on first proposition less effective. Because they come out and say, we're going to solve the problem. And then opposition says, well, you don't solve the entire problem, right? And that's, that's something you can avoid. It's still good to solve a part of the problem. So first two steps, make the status quo intolerable, introduce your solution. Then I think there are three questions you need to answer. I call these the big three, right? So there are three questions. The first is why, so big three. One, why will your solution solve the problem? Sometimes people call this a mechanism, right? The first thing you need to demonstrate in the prime minister's speech <clears throat> is at least one argument that, in fact, 
your solution will ameliorate the problem to some extent. You don't need to demonstrate that it will solve everything. Yeah, that's, that's not what's being asked of you. But in as far as you paint an intolerable status quo, such that any reasonable person who heard your status quo would be motivated to act, and then introduced a solution to that status quo, you need to make an argument that the status quo will in fact, I mean sorry, that the solution will in fact ameliorate the intolerability of the status quo to some degree. Right? That's so often missing, even by very good debaters. They start telling you about all the great impacts that are going to happen without showing to me that the solution will in fact lead to those impacts. So that's called a mechanism, so it's called a link. I don't care what you call it. Why will your solution solve the problem? Second big question. This is the one where you have to make a bit of a value judgment about whether or not you need to make this argument in debate. Sometimes this will not be a contentious issue. Other times it will be an extremely contentious issue. And the question is, why is it legitimate to do your solution? Right? In some debates, everyone will agree that a particular policy is something that it's legitimate for a state or an actor to do, but it just might not be the right decision at this time. There are other times where we might argue that it is illegitimate for the state ever to do this type of behavior, or, or to have ever do this type of behavior. So, you know, um, what, you know let's say uh, uh, there could be, this house would require, uh, the, 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 um, this house would require everyone to vaccinate their children, let's say, every person regardless of religious or philosophical objection. That would be a debate in which this could be a hugely contentious issue, whether or not it's legitimate to do that solution. Because there's going to be big questions about whether the government has the right to intervene in people's lives in the way. It, this issue, the first one, why will your solution solve the problem? Pretty straightforward, right? Everyone gets vaccinated, fewer people get diseases that are prevented by vaccination. Not really a, much debate there. But there's going to be a lot of debate here about whether it's legitimate for the state to do that. In a different type of debate, um, you know, it, it, there's going to be a lot more debate here than here, maybe. Right? Like, this legalize all drugs, for instance, which we talk about a, a lot, right? You've got drug wars, you've got violence, that sort of thing. Like, there's going to be quite a lot of debate, but whether legalizing it will actually bring that to a halt. Like, will that actually be prevented by legalization? Or will we have more problems, right? So the debate's going to center more here than it is here. Right? But, and in some debates, both of these questions need to be answered. And you kind of need to make a value judgment in your prep time about which of those questions the debate's going to center on. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is what will the world look like, that's the planet, see, after your solution, right? This is where you go ham on the impacts. And you start describing to me how things are going to be better. This is where you can add in peripheral impacts. By the way, we're going to get these other benefits. By the way, we're going to get these other things, right? This is a pretty complete prime minister speech, I think. Like, it, it, it's, just, it's just five steps. Describe a problem such that any person who heard it makes it intolerable. Describing a solution that's clear, making clear arguments about how your solution solves the problem, and then answering these questions. You know, I mean, sorry, answering these questions. Why was this solved problem? Why is it legitimate? And what will the world, how will the world be better after your solution is implemented? So this isn't very scary, I don't think. Like, I think this is something that's actually fairly easy to do. And I guarantee you, if you do this effectively, in most debates, you're going to do well. Like, you're going to have a very solid and significant contribution to the debate. The reason people do poorly in first government most of the time, I think, is one of two things. Either they know nothing about the topic, in which case, you know, that's an issue. And there's a separate discussion after that. Or they miss one of these key parts. They fail to demonstrate that the solution will actually solve the problem. Although they demonstrate the solution will solve the problem, they fail to show that uh, the status quo is actually a situation that needs to be solved, right? That, that merits uh, action. They fail to demonstrate th these sorts of things. That's why people do poorly on first proposition, not because it's the first position. That they, I think. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah. So, is the impact of your third question post all the list of the arguments, or is it before that? 
What do you mean? Like in the uh, prime minister's speech, are you expected to list or at least outline your main arguments? Well, I think these are the arguments, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So I think you'll say, uh, describe the problem. Here's what we propose. I'm going to make three arguments. First, I'm going to demonstrate that doing this will help to solve the problem to some degree. Second, I'm going to talk to you about why this is the appropriate role of the state, of parents, of teachers, of doctors. So Third, I'm going to talk to you about these other things we're going to get. So your second thing is more like principled approach. Like exactly. 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 Yeah. And remember, like what I'm saying is this is just, you know, it's a frame. I, I don't think you should come up and say I'm not going to answer the big three questions. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about uh, Deputy Prime Minister's speech. Deputy Prime Minister's speech is very interesting in a policy way. Um, I, in many ways, I think it's the most important speech in the world. Because, um, but it's, it's not quite as complicated. It's actually really straightforward. Um, I think the first thing you obviously need to do is respond to the leader of the opposition. So the leader of the opposition is going to make positive arguments, right? They're just going to do two things. One, they're going to respond to the prime minister. The leader of the opposition is going to say, the prime minister said X, Y, and Z. Here are my responses to X, Y, and Z. We'll deal with that in a minute. The next thing the leader of the opposition is going to do is they're going to make positive opposition arguments. They're going to make independent case in favor of whatever advocacy position they're taking in the debate, right? The first thing I think you can do is the DPM is to respond to these new positive arguments. The LO came out with whatever, whatever, whatever. We have substantive responses. Right? Everyone knows that. That's obvious. You do rebuttal. What people don't do a lot of times, and what I think makes the really effective uh, DPM speech, is you want to make the PM as good as before the LO. Right? And this is where I actually think the debates First government, a lot of times it's won or lost, is you need to respond to LO, but one of those important things is rebuilding, actually. So I think a really good portion of the DPM speech should be spent ostensibly on rebuttal, but a lot of that rebuttal is actually reinforcing your positive arguments and, and defending them from the attacks that were made in the previous speech, right? Because you want the debate to be as focused on your argumentation as possible. Right? So you're going to make yourself say a little, but then you also want to say, OK, I respond to their positive arguments. I also want to talk a little bit about what they said about the prime minister's speech and have responses to those, with the goal being that the prime minister's speech seems as good as it did prior to the LO speech. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, the last thing you want to do is one, at least, maybe two, but probably one, impact heavy. Argument. New argument. New argument. Correct. The deputy prime minister should have a new argument, and it should be an argument with some degree of weight. Uh, you know, and this is a decision you need to make with you and your partner. But I think a lot of people do this absolute front load. Where they're like, we're going to put all of our major arguments in the prime minister's speech, uh, and DPM's just going to come up with something on the fly. Um, I know very, very talented debaters who do that and it works for them. I don't think that's the right approach, in my opinion. In my opinion, um, this is a really good opportunity for you to introduce a new argument that likely will be responded to both by both opposition teams. Right? Like, it's very, very easy for an argument in the prime minister to only be responded to by the opening opposition. By the time it gets to the closing opposition, it's kind of gone out of the debate. It still can happen with DPM arguments, but it's less likely, right? It's, it is less likely. Um, so that's, that's the goal. Now, I want to talk a couple things about um, just kind of first government strategy. I want to talk a little bit about some things that I think are really important to insert in arguments. And I want to talk about points of information to ask as first government in a policy debate, and then we'll move on to analysis debate. But questions before that? Just retouching, sorry to go back to no, the please. PM, but the difference between why we, your solution solve the problem and why is it legitimate to solution yeah. is like the timing is right and the... Oh, oh, okay, I see. So I wasn't was as clear about that as possible. So, so I, 
there's two things you need to establish. If Let's just say we're not in the debate anymore. We're just talking about, I want to do something in the world. Okay. And it doesn't even need to be a political thing. It can be anything. There's two things that you need to establish. Um, one is that if we do this, it will get the outcomes we want. Right? Like, I mean, if, let's say I'm giving a stock recommendation. Uh -huh. Right? Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to want to prove to you is that this is a good stock yeah. that you're going to make money on. And I'm going to give you analysis. I'm going to talk about its long-term success. I'm going to talk about the market trends at the moment. I'm going to talk about all kinds of things. And I'll try to convince you of that. The second thing is that you are, in fact, in a position to purchase that stock. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, the money is yours. <laughs> it's not stolen from somebody. Or, yeah. or, 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 or I have enough of it. Or it's not already appropriated for some other purpose. Yeah. Right? And I think you can kind of think of it that way. Okay. One is that this will actually get the outcomes we want. And the other is that it doesn't break any fundamental rules or, or principles we think are really important to uphold, right? Like, you know, does it, uh, some example I sometimes give is like, look, you know, I could say uh, we want to install a GPS tracking device in, in every person because that will um, make us safe. Well, make us safe, yeah, and, and kidnapping, uh, you know, not a problem anymore. Yeah. We know where everybody is. So it's pretty easy to say, uh, you know, Kidnapping is rampant, it's very bad, people get held for ransom, they get killed, whatever. Pretty easy to that solution solves the problem. But I think there's a legitimacy situation there. Yeah, that with, yeah right? So, gotcha, so gotcha. does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of when you're forming your debate in prep mm -hmm. uh, for the PM speech, mm -hmm. are those big three questions your three main arguments? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So they're, they're one and the same. It's not that I have to answer the three no, questions no, no, no. and also get to the three. No, no, no. I think there. those are the arguments. One is this will work. Two is this is the right thing to do, and three is here's all the good stuff that will happen. Cool. cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about strategy. Um, a couple things that I think uh, will be very important on First Government that will help you do other things. First is, it is very important that the Prime Minister's speech have several good examples. Too often, prime minister speeches remain very theoretical. What I have noticed, and you've probably seen this before too, is that an example will be introduced to the prime minister's speech, and then for the rest of the debate, the debate will happen in reference to that example. Have you seen that happen before? Where someone's like, oh, this is kind of like, like let's say we have a debate that's like, this house supports uh, the military overthrow of corrupt regimes. Right? And then someone uses an example, say they use Ghana as an example. Then the rest of the debate will, although it will be the general topic, Ghana will be referenced over and over again. Right? And the debate will kind of happen in reference to that example. Right? I think if you can do that and set up an example that kind of becomes the linchpin of the debate, uh, it keeps bringing the debate back to your analysis and your arguments. And, and it, you know, you can keep saying that the, uh, that, that um, you know, you came up with that example, and that was the contribution you made. So I think that's a very important strategy to keep in mind. That when you're the prime minister, you want to introduce a major substantive example and analyze that example. Now, where that fits in can be a question. It can fit in in why will your solution solve the problem. You could be like, look, we did this this other time, and it worked. Right? It can be like, what well, good things will happen? Well, when they did something similar, this is what happened. So we can predict that that will happen again, whatever. Uh, why is it legitimate? Well, you know, in states where this has happened, you know, things have, whatever, right? You, you, where you fit it in is less, is less clear, but it needs to be there. There needs to be a substantive, thick example that the debate can grasp onto. And I find that it's a very effective uh, first proposition strategy. Um, cool. So the thing I want to talk about is uh, what types of points of information to ask as first proposition. Because points of information, are your only way to contribute to the debate in the remaining 42 minutes of debating that takes place after your speech. Actually, it's not 42 minutes, it's only five speeches. So it's, what is it, like, uh, 35. 35 minutes. There you go. It's math. Um, in the remaining 35 minutes, it's a fairly long time. It's a lot of time that debate happens when you're done. And it's very easy for the judge to forget you. It's very easy for you to be forgotten. And your only way of participating is by asking points of information. So, these are important. What types of points of information do you think are good to ask on opening government? Yeah. 
ones where like you kind of mentioned things that you said. Yeah. And you're like you you know you still haven't answered our original whatever or you know. Right. Absolutely. You want to draw a reference to the arguments that you make in an opening prop. Yeah. I, and you know, this sounds basic, but I have seen debaters over and over, you know, stand up on first proposition. So let's say the closing off is speaking. A uh, prime minister stands for point of information, and they say, you didn't respond to the second government's argument. And it's like, well, that was a waste of your, you know, you, you just stood to it. Like, you know, and, but it happens, because they're like, oh, they're losing, I'm on the other side, you kind of lose sight of what's going on. You want to make sure you're always directing it back. So that's good. What else? What else do you think would be good about points of information from opening government? So bring it back to, to your arguments. How about your examples? Right, the ones that you're trying to get the debate to cling on to? I think using your examples in a point of information can be really good, right? Okay, that argument's interesting, but in this example, it wouldn't have happened that way or something, right? You know what I'm saying? Like introducing your examples into the, into the debate. Um, and I think those are kind of the primary types of points of information that are good tests. Things that reintroduce your arguments, things that reintroduce your examples. It, it's almost like a, a remember I'm here type of exercise. I mean, seriously, like so often I see, and, and, and I see it happen in like weird ways, right? Like one of the most common results in debate is that closing opposition comes first, opening government comes second. And I really think a lot of times it's not that opening opposition, closing opposition made better arguments. It's that they just, people forgot about a lot of the content of the closing, of the opening government's arguments. It wasn't as fresh in their minds. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's kind of your job to, to introduce uh, that, that material. Okay, um, I'm kind of done talking about policy debates and uh, prime minister speeches and DPMs and policy debates. I'm gonna move on to analysis debates now unless people have questions. Is yeah. it, do you think as, um, Open government, it's like it looks better if you PO, if you like POI opening opposition more than you would closing up, or do you think it doesn't really matter? Uh, so I'm sorry, if you're opening government, yeah. do you want to ask more points of information to opening opposition or closing opposition? Is yeah. that your question? Or assuming, I mean, assuming they're somewhat equal, I guess. Because yeah, like closing so off is like the superior team, obviously. You're you want to you want to hit them more, hit them yeah. Like but but um, assuming they're equal, I think you want to spread them across. But I think. The biggest risk, and the, it is once the closing half of the debate starts. Yeah. Right. Everyone's seen this happen. You want to look desperate, basically. But I don't know how to. You know. Right. Um, well, do you want to make sure that the, your arguments remain relevant? Right. And yeah. and I think like if you make these arguments, they are they are the debate. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that that that's what the debate's about. And so it's it's yeah trying to avoid falling into irrelevance. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Though. Other questions. Cool. All right, let's talk about analysis debates. Analysis debates are a lot of fun, but they're very, very different from policy debates. Because you're not asking anyone to do anything and no consequences result, right? Which is like so different from every other debate. So we're not gonna talk, we just don't talk about impacts. There aren't impacts. Um, okay, so what's the first thing you do in a policy, in an analysis debate? This is where teams lose, always, in analysis debates. Define x. Define what the statement means. What is the Arab Spring? Does the Arab Spring include the Syrian revolution? Does it include everything that's happened up until now in Libya? Does it only include two or three years of events, right? That's not obvious what the Arab Spring is. What is interpersonal communication? Like, you know, if we're saying smartphones are done better or worse for interpersonal communication, what are we talking about? Unlike almost every other debate, these debates can be won or lost on definition. On coming with the, and, and defense of a definition, right? Um, you know, what does the statement mean? What does it mean to regret? Does it mean it would cause more harm than good? Does it mean it was massively harmful? Does it mean uh, we think that governments should take corrective policies? Like, what is it, you know, these definitions are really, really important. And I can't give you a plan 
for how to come up with a definition. That's something you have to think about given your arguments, given the topic, given what you think the proposition's like, what they think the opposition's like to say. But what I can tell you is that having a clear definition is almost the most important <coughs> thing in analysis debate. Making sure it's very clear what we're debating about. Make sense? Second thing sort of tied into that, but it's a little bit different. And it is criteria for evaluating. So this house regrets the Arab Spring. What does that mean? What does it mean? If, if, I, if I say, that statement is true, I regret the Arab Spring. What does that mean? Yeah. It regrets the human suffering and also the I mean, that's that's one thing it could mean, right? But it could be, yeah, well, sure. Sometimes when we use is that there's an alternate possibility or like an alternate world that could have existed had this thing not happened. Right. So, so and, and we like that world better or we like that world worse. That's definitely one way of evaluating the debate. But even then we get, in, we get into a lot of issues because it depends who you are. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, if you're uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, you certainly regret the Arab Spring. No, man, this is serious. You know what I mean? I tell you, if you're part of a, a class that was in power during that, you might regret it. Uh, if you're part, of, if, if all your whole concern is stability in the Middle East, if you're a business person who has got business interests in, in, in the Arab world, then you probably regret the Arab Spring to some degree, right? Because it's disrupted your business interests, right? And, and, and those are people who have who we care about in some sense, right? You know, if you are in Syria, you might, in some sense, regret the Arab Spring because there's more violence now than, than was there before. Maybe not. Maybe there's, there's, you know, it was worse. It was really bad before also. But, you know, it, this is difficult to say what the criteria are for evaluating the debate. Did, do you see why that's like a challenging, yeah? Would defining the house go under the first section? Well, so it depends. Well? It depends. Because sometimes you're given the house, which I think is actually a better way to set these debates. It's like this house as the United States, this house as a first grade teacher, whatever. But sometimes you're not, and you're going to have to roll with that too. And then you're going to have to define what the house is, right? If you're given the house, then all you're defining are the other terms. But if you're not, then you've got to define the house also. But criteria is how you end up winning, it's part of how you end up winning debates in analysis space. Right? What are the criteria for evaluation? It's hard. This is a hard thing to do, right? Because, so uh, uh, I'll tell you a motion that once happened. This house believes that President Obama has failed. A motion that was set at a tournament. What is the criteria? Be hard. Arbitrary. <laughs> Yeah, but like, but I mean, yeah, of course it's arbitrary, but you're going to have to set it. You have to say, like, go into what, what do we hope to get out of a president? Keeping his campaign promises. So that's one possibility, that he made promises. So the way we're going to evaluate this debate is, uh, we're going to say, on opening government, President Obama has failed. He did not fulfill a majority of his campaign promises. And if we can demonstrate that to you, then we've won the debate. That's one way you could do it. Sure. What's another way? Uh, we're going to have to move the nation forward in terms of um, just cultural, political, social progress. I'm sorry? Moving the country forward in like social, cultural, political progress. Sure, so you could say, I mean, but you know, that, that might be, yeah, so, so that's good. You could say, moving the, he has he moved the country forward has to be advanced under his presidency. What's another thing? Just like, you could be some more economic about it. You could be like, talk about um, his, his like spending on wars, like, I don't know how you would frame that in terms of like a broad sweeping he has failed as president though. Right. Sort of no, this is why these are difficult debates. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, uh, here I'll give you another. When faced the majority of the decisions he was faced with in which he had an option, he chose the more damaging one. I don't mm -hmm. know. That's sort of too broad. But. Right. Is this motion actually taken seriously by like um, This sounds top? like a, yeah. What what level was this debate at? It's just at like a American BP tournament. Okay. It's not like it was like really vague for like a. It was a final. Really? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
But like, why is that a bad debate? I mean, don't you think that's an important cultural well, I think discussion my, to have? Like, I think it's like a dinner have, table discussion. On no, this. I it's think like, the top half is so for the, the, open, the, half, the bottom half. What did you say? I think the top half has full capacity to screw over the bottom half. Yeah, I mean, but you'd be, so this is the great thing about PP that you're penalized for doing that. Right, like, in some sense, right, if you set up a bad debate such that there's not debate to have, right. that's bad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, you're supposed to make, the goal is not to, to, to make it so there's nothing to talk about in the bottom No, half. no, but I feel like, like, this motion compared to other motion, it's just harder for the closing half to Yeah, right, 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 that's what we're talking about. Don't yeah. You, in that, with that motion, don't you think it's extremely advantageous to be in the top half? Yeah. Because imagine the kind of bullshit that could come up. It's advantageous to be OG, oh, you Okay, okay, so, so why do we think this? This is a good chat. Well, I think that it would be benefit, especially advantageous to the opening government, as like so long as we assume you make something of a sensible argument yeah. for why it's failed. Because then, like, I don't know, on opening up, you have to. You don't have to preempt that as much as you. I don't know. It's just like well, you can do two things. There's just so many things you can say that it's hard to kind of prepare to what you want to say against it for in support of it. All. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But you also don't know that the judge is going to be persuaded by your criteria. Yeah. Right. Like the more outlandish you get, the less likely the judge is going to be persuaded by your criteria. Right. Yeah. So this is the thing. We we're walking this thin line between using criteria that's advantageous for our side, but nevertheless sets up a robust debate, right? And then that's, that's the challenge. And so what I have found to be effective is going as broad as possible. You know, um, so this, you know, if I said this is please Obama has failed, I would say the criteria we're gonna judge this debate on is I think that, you know, if I were to open the government, I would say the average American is worse off now than they were before Obama's presidency. You know, I mean, I think that's a total, and then you can, but see, actually, I'm glad we had this discussion because you've sort of sat on what's difficult about these debates, is they can be about anything. And the team that sets up a solid criteria that the debate can revolve around goes a very long way to setting up a robust debate and winning the debate. I really think they do. Here's another analysis debate, very, very different from Obama. Um, this house believes that multiculturalism is bad for feminism. So, so, so these are these are so, so we have two words we need to define. Should you still want to explain multiculturalism? I can better define the latter, right? <laughs> okay, go for it. Is it like is it trying to get at like feminism should align itself with other racial equality movements? Not exactly. Not so right. multiculturalism, actually I think there was an info slide for this debate. Right. But multiculturalism is a position in political philosophy that um, endorses what are called group differentiated rights. So the idea is that, um, to some extent, and there's debate about to what extent, states should refrain from infringing on the ability of racial, ethnic, religious groups to self-govern. So for instance, if a um, Islamic community wants to uh, require women to wear uh, facial coverings or head coverings in public, mm -hmm. the state should not prevent them from doing that. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Or, or, or um, it's often clashed against what we call classical liberalism, right? Um, that, uh, or you know, maybe uh, that if whatever. So, so, so group differential rights. So you can see why this. Some people might think this is bad for feminism, right? Because right. there are a number of groups who want to impose policies or, or rules or norms that seem, at least to us, many of us, harmful to women. But would you define which wave of feminism you're in? Because wouldn't they be well, not damning to a third wave, but damning to a second wave? Correct. <laughs> yeah. So this is an issue, right? This is a hard debate to define. So let's talk about it. Okay. How would you define it? I mean, if I were gov, I would say damning to the second wave of feminism. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so would you want to explain the difference between second and third wave of feminism? Um, let's see. So, fem so I think second wave is more like um, you're infringing upon like um, okay, it's hard. the third third wave is much easier to find. It's like uh, what we can do with whatever the hell we want. So like second wave feminism is when if you don't mind. Yeah, but second wave feminism is when women are so fed up with oppression that they were starting to like just try to start society without the involvement of men. Right. So they were rejecting the things that they felt uh, continued to oppress them like bras and um, 
part of a, a, a woman involved in the work in the movement uh, started to refuse to stop having intercourse with men. They just didn't want it. They were so fed up. They just didn't want that to be part of it. So yeah, okay. So so then then we just have a third wave. It's just like uh, there's less of like this woman overall doing something against patriarchy. Exactly. Like so 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 yeah. So I think this is the the, the distinction. Because I mean, it's true, this did happen, but it was fairly extreme versions of, oh, yeah. of, of, of second wave feminism. But, but I think second wave feminism, as far as I understand it, views um, the women's struggle as women contra the patriarchy. Yep. That there is an oppressive force in society, and that those women, and that's forcing women to behave in particular ways, and women should not behave, should actively resist behavior in those particular ways. The third wave takes a different approach, which says more, this is obviously hyper overgeneralized, but says that women, what we really should hope for is that women can be autonomous to make choices about what to do with their lives. And if that means they want to live in a particular way that um, might have been viewed as oppressive or, or harmful by some other women, it's not, it, we should let them make that choice. They should be allowed to make that choice. They should. Is that? It's like a hiccup. Oh. <laughs> she's doing it. She's had sneezing weirdly. <laughs> Weirdly, she sits in the back of the room, so I just think that's all it is. I'm over it. It's good. <laughs> um, What's up? Yeah. Um, like, I think the problem I have is like, when I hear questions like that, I just want to say, I don't know, like, I just go straight to my ideology. It's just like, oh, I'll each person make their own. Right. Like, I'll, fi I'll probably get <laughs> I'd be really anxious, and then be like, why can't we just have each woman choose their own version of feminism that they want to follow, and then, like, allow, I, I guess I just have to put it into an argument, but like, right. oh, then allow uh, whatever culture they feel, like, would best represent them. It's right, it's yeah, I mean. a culture that was, like, so patriarchal that they are. Like, well, I mean, that's the question, right? Yeah. We're, not, we're talking about these cultures that are so patriarchal. Yeah. So, and, right. And, and so, so, you know, and multiculturalism is an absolute, right? Like, it doesn't necessarily say, well, we have to let people, you know, do, I, commit honor killings or whatever, right? But it's, uh... As long as it, I, well, it's like, as long as it allows, like, as long as the culture doesn't allow the woman to not have a choice. And that's the difference. Like, it, like that's the bar, bar. Like, as long as the woman has a decision to participate however she wants, and that's fine. I mean, the yeah. question so is then, whether that woman has a choice, whether that woman's choice Entitles her to choose to live in a society where she does not have choice, right? And perhaps whether it's that society that in, imposes that life, like onto her. So it's more of a question of do these women actually have a choice? Like, if well, there and that, I mean, that's certainly part of the question. Absolutely. Um, so is that would that be the X? Well, so yeah, like, maybe do the women have a, uh, the women have a choice, right? So, so so this is this is a very difficult debate. But what we have to do first of all, we have to define multiculturalism, which we've done. We need to define feminism. So feminism can be defined in a number of ways. You have a, you talk about traditional academic definitions of feminism, second wave, third wave feminism. You can talk about more broad definitions of feminism, sort of pop culture definitions of feminism. You might say, well, is the average woman better off in a multicultural in a society that embraces multiculturalism versus a society that embraces a more classical liberal agenda, right? Um, you could say uh, you could talk about. So we want to use empirical indicators, right? In, in, in multicultural societies, uh, how many women are educated? How many women you know, have jobs? You, you could say that. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could approach this. But and, and I think this is a really interesting discussion to have on how to run this debate in particular and a lot of other debates. But what I'm trying to indicate here is that um, a criteria is really, really important because these debates become so sloppy so fast. They just feel people saying stuff that's about two totally different things. And to establish that criteria and defend, this is one of the weirdest things, because you have to do a bit of meta-debating why the criteria is fair. I actually think you need to spend the 30 seconds, 40 seconds being like, and we think this is a good way to decide this debate because. Which typically you wouldn't do in a policy debate. You wouldn't like tell the judge how to function. But I actually think it's a, it's a good thing to do. Say, we think this debate should be about uh, the average well-being of women in these societies because we think that that's the broadest and fairest definition of feminism and allows for the most argumentation and clash to take place in the debate. Right? You could say something like that. 
And then you just give reasons why you're winning on the criteria. I mean, this isn't that hard. Once you get past the criteria, it's pretty easy. You're just like, here's why on this metric we're winning. And those are your arguments, right? You might have two, three reasons, whatever. Those are just your arguments. Right, so in some ways, these debates are really simple. Uh, in other ways, they're very, very hard. You know, because you have to set a criteria. Once you got a criteria, I think all kind of comes naturally, and then we're just talking impacts. Yeah. And do all three of the arguments relate directly back to, to the criteria? criteria? Of course, okay. directly back to the evaluative criteria. So you, there's no straying and saying, oh, this happens too, and it's good. Yeah, but you, well, so you'd have to have a broader criteria, then, mm -hmm. right? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Because ultimately, this is about, is this true or false? And for me to make that decision, I need to have some metric for making that decision. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wait, one second. Yeah. Um, how much credit are, is OG give, um, be given if um, the criteria set up and definition set up, but the reasons are less developed and are taken more by CG? I mean, it's so hard to say. Okay. Like, it, without seeing it. But, 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 like, if, but, um, but if you do the setting up and criteria, like, that is not part of the too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's a very important part. I mean, a big part of what opening prop does is set up a debate. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes I've heard British parliamentary debate and world debate be referred to as so it's almost like a like a dancing competition. It's like whoever does the most beautiful dance wins. Whereas APTA is like a boxing match. APTA, like, yeah. It's like whoever knocks out the other team. You don't have to win every argument with the debate. Okay, cool. So we talked a little bit about the different types of things to do in first prop. Um, we talked a little bit about criteria. That's kind of my prepared chat. Uh, I would love to answer your questions, and I'd love to give you the opportunity to give some prime minister speeches, if you'd like. Uh, we got half an hour, so if you have questions, we can do that. Otherwise, I can just give you topics and you can give a prime minister speech. Yes. So well, I guess one small question. Yeah, please. For that. Um, what are the criteria that you would set for the multi for the multi multiculturalism uh, and feminism? I think I would say um, where. I, I would say two things. I would say we want to look at two factors. One, where is violence against women lowest? I think sometimes when you're having a hard time with criteria, you just want to go to the minimalist thing. Like, where are women not being killed? Like, you know, that's got to be better than where they are being killed. You know what I mean? Like, you just default to the minimum. And then the second thing I want to say is, where are women more able to attain their aspirations? Right? And I think you can say, in multicultural societies, both of those things are. But then you have to have a debate about what an aspiration is. I mean, seriously. Because, because you know, we, I mean, like, it's not just, we, we have a tendency, I think, to be like, oh, like, if people are raised like crazy societies and they want to like, wear burkas and stuff. But like, we all want weird shit that has to do with how we were brought up, right? We would want totally different things if we were brought up somewhere else. So it's unclear that any aspiration is like more legitimate than any other one. You know? So does that become the debate? Then? It, it can be. That's an awesome debate. It was a Euros final. I recommend you watch it. Yeah? What is the time breakdown of when you model or when you define? So, okay, so <laughs> this is a really great question. Um, this should take, unless, with very rare exception, this should take no more than two minutes. These two things together. You want five minutes to do clear mechanistic work clear principled argumentation, clear whatever. Over here, it really depends. Like, because sometimes the criteria is what the debate's gonna be about. Like, how do we adjudicate this type of question? Other times, it's really gonna be a lot more about your reasoning, and it just, it, it really has to be about it. I wish I could give you a more concrete answer, but I sort of can't. But this one, I can. And, and, and you know, keep in mind that probably 80, 90% of debates are policy -based. Analysis debates tend to be finals. They kind of lend themselves well to finals because people can have like flowing and philosophical rhetoric. Um, but they sometimes occur in in rounds, and I've seen them in in rounds. Also, you want to win the final? Okay. Uh, what else you got? Cool. What are we thinking for deputy for the second? Speech? Oh, for the second speech. Is so, so you want? It's a lot of the same things. It's a lot of this the leader op responses and making the PM as good as before. And then you might have additional reasons, right? You might have like additional reasons yeah. why you're winning on the criteria. But it's a lot of the same. 
as, I mean, really what I want you to take away from this about DPM is the importance of rebuilding. Like, I think that's really my primary thing about W Prime Minister, is that it's not just rebuttal and construction. Rebuilding the PM's position in the debate is really important. Uh, okay, who would like to do a Prime Minister speech? Cool. So why don't I give you all topics, and then I'll give you like six or seven minutes to prep. Um, actually, it might be fun to do the same topic. Now you do multiple prime minister speeches. See how that goes. It'd be interesting to see how people like, how we define or how, how people do it differently. Yeah. All right. Let's do that. Uh, let's say this house would require new fathers to take paternity leave. Once again. This house would require new fathers to take paternity leave. Okay, so take seven, eight minutes. You know what? Maybe not. Why don't we do? Let me take two back. Why don't we do these three parts? Right? You could describe a problem, have a model, and then do some the mechanism. Maybe it'll take three or four minutes.
All right, one more minute. Cool. Uh, so we won't have time for all of you, but I want to do a couple. Who wants to go? Yes. Yeah. So fathers taking paternity leave, required to take paternity leave. Big change. Speaker, uh, I'm excited to have this debate as I think it's an important one because the status quo is currently sexist. I'll explain. It reinforces gender roles. It sets the idea that men have to continue working and women are the ones that care for the children and the ones that stay in the house. Now, responsibilities aren't shared equally in this situation and, it, and the status quo, by virtue of being the status quo, reinforces itself and continues and propagates this same culture that has been around for centuries and is not necessarily the, the way that each family wants to operate or should operate. Now, women fear taking jobs if they want to start a family. They fear asking for promotions because they are about to, they're about to embark on, the, on like starting a family or they're about to have a child and they don't want to, they don't want an employer not to take them because of the expectation of maternity leave. For instance, men who, uh, men sometimes fear requesting paternity leave because they fear being uh, perceived as weak or as a person that doesn't belong in a corporate environment or in a working environment. Now, my solution, our solution on, on this side of the house, is that fathers are allowed the same amount of, uh, of paternity leave as mothers in that same field of work um, and receive with the same amount of pay as mothers in that same field of work receive in maternity leave. Now, I al uh, now we also want to add another stipulation that men are expected to take it if their spouse decides to do so as well. Now, why will this work? Because the culture and the societal norms behind gender roles are, will shift. The culture behind, men, uh, uh, behind what roles men and women take in the house shift and change drastically because these conversations are sparked. Not just across the board as, as a country because we've set in place these new laws, but also within each individual family. We, uh, in instating this policy, we force these conversations to happen. Now, thank you. Cool. Oh, that was good. Um, so the setup was really solid, like the problem mm -hmm. solution. I think the mechanism could have been a little bit better done. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, like, I think you started to get at it when you said, um, when you said, uh, excuse me, that this will force these conversations to happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's like really where the where your change advocacy. Yeah. Is coming from right, like because we now have this law, people are going to have to change their behavior, make choices, da, da, da. but I think you could do a better job explaining to me how we get there, right? Rather than just saying it forces these conversations to happen. Okay, how why? would you link those? Well, I would say something like, look, uh, it used to be the case that it was just sort of thought of that the mother was going to take paternity leave. Now both parents have to. So all of a sudden, at the very least, the father is going to be engaged in childcare that he would otherwise not have been. Or at least for at least some period of time. Mm -hmm. What is that going to do? Well, it could do a few things. One thing that it could do is it could demonstrate to the father that childcare is a more difficult task than he perceived. 
like one of the big problems is that men think childcare is easy. And they're like, it's very simple, I could do it. It's important that I go do my difficult job. Well, my, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I think that notion is challenged by being forced to, to do that. The second thing is by giving the woman the opportunity, at least for some period of time, to be the breadwinner, right? It may be the case that some men prefer that arrangement, and some women prefer that arrangement, and they would never have been exposed to that arrangement in the absence of it. Do you see what I'm saying? You, just, you give scenarios such that it seems likely that these things are going to happen. So would those be the examples, or would you think of a more concrete? Yeah, I think those could be examples. I mean, sometimes you're, you don't have any because you've never done it before. So you just have to. All right, Joy. Oh, yeah. Hi, oh, you. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, in Western liberal democracies, it is incredibly regrettable that mo when most countries already have in place maternity leave policies, but still that does not have in place any kind of paternity leave or any kind of stipulation that allow men to take days off work, paid while being next to their child and um, sharing the responsibility of child care. We thought for this issue by bringing today the motion, this house will require new fathers to take paternity leave. We, so we structure it in the way that Switzerland have it in place most of the time. Whereas the Switzerland model is shared, we have it in place that the, uh, the paternity leave and maternity, maternity leave could be shared or not shared depending on the uh, parental uh, arrangement. We think that in doing so, we solve for two issues mainly. First of all, we see a better uh, care, and, care and development of the child from the shared responsibility, from a joint parenthood and less than that on the father's part. But further, we tell you that we advance uh, gender equality more so in Western liberal democracies. That is both and the principle um, that, that both advance the principles of democracy, but also leads to better hiring practice, better uh, workplace policies for women. How do we how do we do that? First of all. In, in, uh, in democracies, we think equality is an extremely important principle. Not just because we can say, uh, we, we can say now all, all, all uh, people are equal under the law, but rather we think that responsibilities, responsibilities has to be shared across the board. And not just the fact that father work and woman, uh, woman take care of the house is sort of equality, but rather we think that mixing up the role and, uh, and taking away the stereotype or discrimi discrimination against women because of, because of the appearance that they cannot work uh, outside of the house. We think that in, uh, by doing so, we conform more to the, uh, to the uh, ideals of uh, principles of democracies. But then we tell you that it also leads to better childcare. Why is this the case? We have when more people access the basics of childcare, for example, going to classes about teaching you how to care for newborns, going to uh, medical, uh, treat, uh, good medical treatments if, you're, if your newborn child needs any, will actually increase the, the, the usage of this, meaning that if, the, the, if, the, if these new fathers can find out uh, any cases that should be improvements made or any kind of inequalities in the system, they're better at re reporting it. Why is this the case? First of all, we think that female, uh, mothers currently are already burdened with many, uh, many unfortunately that we regret the you know, chores of housework and has less time to devote to our child in the beginning, to begin with, because most fathers just do the, uh, do the job outside the house. But further we tell you that the men in these societies, while regrettable, are also in more powerful positions and are better advocates for change, uh, a, a better advocates for changes in the policy. So therefore, when they actually encounter any issues that they deem is unfair or uh, should be changed, they are more in a position to change these. But then we tell you why this will, for, uh, in the long term, lead to better, hair, better hiring practices um, in the workplace. I, as we cur currently know, the pay between uh, women and men are not the same, uh, especially, uh, especially in uh, top hiring or um, financial or other uh, corporate firms. And why is that the case? It's because women are perceived to have to take time off for pregnancies and for uh, newborn and perhaps for maternity leaves once they come to term, or once they uh, experience that. So managers have less of an incentive to hire women and further to uh, more incentive to, to fire or lay them off right before they get pregnant or right, right before they have to give birth. But when now you have uh, uh, this motion will not solve for all the inequalities in the workplace, we think that will ameliorate it to a much uh, uh, to to. A, to a, to a great extent, when the, uh, when the father now too also have to take time off their work, uh, having also compensated by the employer uh, by the employer for the same amount of time that the, uh, that the mother is uh, compensated for. For all these reasons, we're proud to propose. Uh, great. Thanks for that. Um, I thought I was... Can I add on? I feel like I ran out of arguments. No, that was good. No, no, no. I mean, like, that was... You did good arguments. You didn't need to add anything. 
What were you at? No, I like the stuff about hiring. Um, I thought that was interesting. Why did you set it up that it could be, like, why do you still require the mother to do it? No, no, I'm not saying require. I'm saying, like, in these countries, because mothers are, are, are like, most Western, like, European countries already have maternity leave in place. Mm -hmm. So, like, but they, I don't know, I don't know if it's true, but I don't, I don't think they have maternity leave in place. So I'm just, like, saying. Right, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way I would model this is I would say we're going to let women take paternity, maternity leave if they'd like to. Mm -hmm. We're going to require fathers to take. Okay. And, and I also think you should say a time. Say what? Make like how long? A time. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Because how long is maternity leave? Is it well, it, it varies yeah. drastically by country. In the United States, there are three weeks of unpaid maternity leave guaranteed. Unpaid? Unpaid. We are the only developed country that has unpaid maternity leave. Wow. I didn't know that it was unpaid. And it's three weeks. So what's the point of making it a law? Well, because they can't fire you. Oh, OK. They can't fire you for taking maternity gotcha. leave. They have to give you, yeah, exactly. actually, but they, but they sort of can. Because they have to give you a substantively similar position when you return. Mm -hmm. But debts could be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like, this used to be a position where I was likely to be promoted. I'm now no longer, you know what I mean? Like, all kinds of things yeah. like that. Um, a lot of countries is a lot longer. Kind of the standard in Europe is six weeks of paid leave. But, you know, there are some arguments that's like, well, if you require companies to have offer paid leave to mothers, then they're just not going to hire women in the first place. Could be worse. If you require paternity leave, then it's also paid. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So who are they going to hire them? Um, yeah, so I thought that was good. Um, we have four minutes, so why don't we go back and... Uh, have a debate. Let's have a debate in four minutes. Cool. Like what? Like a practice, like a debate. Oh. At four o'clock, there's going to be a debate. Oh, Do you say that example, okay. examples are less needed? So I think examples are needed, but I think it's more scenario building yeah. than it is like examples of places where yeah. this is happening. Okay, it's just fun, guys. I enjoyed it.